Your chat is working. I wonder, so I can, can the other- Q&A is coming up. Who did that? Elaine. Okay, so Q&A is working. So we'll have people use Q&A. Okay. All right, great. We'll have people use Q and A, and um, you know, if you're late, you're late. I think we need to just go ahead and get started. So, hey, everybody! It Hello. Is, it is Tuesday, the 16th of August. I'm Lorna Henning. I'm not Lorna Hennington. I'm Hi, Tracy Lorna. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm Tracy, Tracy Bates. Bates. <laughs> <laughs> and where, whichever way you're looking, is Lorna Hennington. That's me. <laughs> and we have. Andy Kristenot. Andy Kristenot is our preferred lender. She is with Movement Mortgage. She is a branch manager there. She knows all things. Can I say you know all things finance, interest rate, money, mortgages, all of that stuff? That is that's true. I, I'm sure I don't know everything, but okay. you know. Well, we we like to think that we, you do. we learn something new every day in this in this world. So. We and things do. are constantly changing. So, but Andy is the most um, on top of it resource. So if, if it's changed, give her five minutes and she'll get right up. <laughs> and she'll figure it out. She's the expert. And the reason why she is um, the one that we pulled into this to educate everybody and bring them up to speed is because we stay in our real estate lane. Her lane changes by the second. We have enough to keep up with, with real estate. So we stay in that lane and we leave it all to Andy. So did you want to say anything else, Lorna, before we got started? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, there's a lot of confusion in the market right now about what's going on with interest rates, what's going on with recession, what's going on with inflation, what's going on with availability of uh, availability of properties to purchase. And I think Andy's really going to give us an opportunity to explore all that, get a lot of that cleared up. So, um, and Tracy and I will chime in about things that have to do with the real estate market, but Andy is the maven of all things finance. Um, and we would ask that if you have questions, you put them in the Q&A and we'll We'll um, kind of move them into the conversation as it goes along rather than saving everything to the end. But if your question didn't get answered during the, the webinar, then we will definitely catch you before we end it. Well, so thanks, thanks, ladies. Yeah, let's get going. I'm excited to be here. Um, I, I'm going to share my screen. I've got a couple of slides for everybody. Um, like Lorna said, there's a lot of there's a lot of noise and a lot of misinformation out there, you turn on any news channel, any economics channel, there's a lot of buzz going around about what is happening in, in the housing market. Also with mortgage rates, we hear Fed fund rate all the time. What's the Fed doing? They're raising rates again. And it creates this hysteria uh, with, with consumers. And if you really, if, if you don't know the, the underlying information and really how these things work, it can be really confusing and, and all of a sudden people get nervous and maybe hit the pause button. And the truth is, is that there's no reason to hit pause. There's um, a lot of inner workings to how mortgage rates work and how the Fed fund rate works. And what's happening with, you know, are we in a recession? Are we leaning in towards a recession? What does that mean for housing? Are we yeah. coming into a, a housing crash? Um, what, what does all this mean? What does it look like? So I'm just here to, to sort of decipher information and, and hopefully give you a few tidbits to take away. And the next time you're in a conversation at a, at a dinner or a, a birthday party and somebody's talking about interest rates or they're talking about the housing market, um, hopefully I can give you some information that, that clarifies what's really happening um, in, in the market. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Excellent, Andy. I just want to say, you know, we all watch the news and they do have to get their ratings. So sometimes things sound very frightening um, and it's better to get the real information from someone who knows what they're talking about. Yes, it, um, it, it's true. And I hate to use the word fake news, but you you don't always get the, the full story when they're, when they're, trying to sell ratings, right? So, right. okay, I am going to unshare really quick so that I can start this. Sorry about that. No problem. 
And again, for those of you who are just joining us, because I see a couple new people, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we will um, make sure we have time, make time for it during the. Okay, there we go. I'm not sure why it does that. Um, it's not letting me. It's not letting you do full screen. There we go. Okay. There you go. Ruby. Here we go. Okay. Market update. Rates, inflation, and recession. What does it mean? Um, on July 27th, the Fed uh, did their, their latest increase of the Fed fund rate by three quarters of a percent. Um, the reason that uh, the feds do that, they are trying to curb inflation. And inflation is the value of the US dollar has gone down while the cost of goods goes up. That means that we're obviously we're paying more and getting less for our money. Really, the only tool in the toolbox for the Fed is to is to raise this prime rate. Mm. And instantly, consumers think that directly means that mortgage rates go up. People think the Fed raises the interest rate by three quarters of a percent. That means that mortgage rates go up by three quarters of a percent. And that is not true. The Fed fund rate is the term and the rate at which short-term money is borrowed. It's the rate at which banks borrow money between each other and the rate at which, at which banks borrow money between the banks and the Feds. It's also think short-term money like credit cards, student loans, car loans, things like that, anything on a short-term basis mm -hmm. is directly impacted by the Fed fund rate. So every time they're raising interest rates by three quarters of a percent, that is directly impacted on your credit card statement. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's impacted on if you're going to go out and, and buy a car tomorrow, uh, student loans. So think short-term money. Mortgage rates are not dictated by the Fed fund rate. When the Fed raises that Fed fund rate, generally speaking and historically speaking, mortgage rates go down. And that's because mortgage rates are driven mainly by inflation. Mm. And so, so big misconception, when the Fed increases the rate, there's, there's another increase coming in September. Uh, could be half a percent, it could be three quarters, it could be 1%. There's lots of buzz and lots of talk over the course of the next couple of weeks related to the next uh, Fed rate increase. That is their way of curbing inflation. They are trying to get people to spend less and save more. It's simple economics of supply and demand. Mm. We obviously have supply issues with COVID, um, supply chain issues, you know, it doesn't matter what you're buying, if you're remodeling a house or you're buying, I mean, we all saw the toilet paper shortage, right, during COVID supply and demand. And so the feds are trying to curb inflation so that the cost of goods start to go down. As people start to spend less money, the cost of goods goes down. Mm. Um, we've seen a pretty drastic drop recently in gas prices. It's obviously still very high, especially here in Los Angeles. Um, they're trying to curb spending. Um, with that said, mortgage rates historically have the opposite impact. So when we start to see inflation get under control, we will start to see mortgage rates drop historically. Mm -hmm. So um, Fed fund rate, just sheer definition, the monetary policy pursued, pursued by the Federal Reserve Bank, it's one of the most important factors influencing the economy and interest rates specifically. Um, it influences mortgage rates, but it is not, it does not mean mortgage rates. So just so, to be clear, I keep saying that, but it's it's really important because it's it's everywhere. Everywhere you, you look, they're talking about the Fed fund, fund rate. So so Andy, that's actually a positive trend then if the when the Fed run raises the rate and starts to get inflation under control under control, then hopefully we'll see a decrease in interest rates for mortgages. Is correct. That, okay. Correct. And I'm going to dive. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper on okay. on why we're seeing. We've seen a drastic increase in mortgage rates in the last uh, eight months. Uh, we're up 
two, anywhere from two and a half to 3% where we were a year ago. Mm -hmm. And this again, goes back to inflation and the value of the dollar. So I like that. I like how you're explaining it though. It, yeah. It's kind of reminding me of Mich Michelle Obama saying, although I, I, I can mix it up a little and say, when they go high, we go low. <laughs> when feds go high, we go low. And interest rates interest go rate, low right? eventually, hopefully. Yeah, I, I like that. I'll, That's I'll take a good that. One. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so if we, if we dissect this a little bit more and think of it from just a general investment perspective, and if you put your, your mortgage investor hat on, mm -hmm. um, mortgage bonds and mortgage-backed securities are bought and traded. They're bought and sold just like stocks are. They're, they're, live securities that investors are purchasing. And if we're talking about a general 30 year loan, that investor is going in and they're purchasing that loan at a, at a cost. They're, they're purchasing it at a premium. You don't just buy a $500,000 loan as an investment at 500,000. They're paying a premium for it. They're paying, they're paying above and beyond what the actual value of the note is. Um, so Although the Fed fund rate is not mortgage rates, inflation does drive mortgage rates, which is where we are now. If you're an investor that's investing in a $500,000 30-year loan that's being taken out by somebody today, and the cost for that investor to take out that, to, to purchase that investment is $520,000, based on where rates are now today, and based on their initial investment to purchase this, this security, odds are they wouldn't see the return on their investment. Mm. That is what has driven up mortgage rates. Investors are going, we've seen this massive jump in rates because inflation has gotten out of control. We're going to pull back on investing in mortgage-backed securities. If they're pulling back, that means that interest rates go up. Mm. So again, supply and demand. It, it's just like the stock market, right? When people start unloading stocks, stock prices fall. Um, with mortgage bonds, when investors pull out, interest rates go up. Um, and so given where the current market is with, with mortgage rates and all the economic signs are pointing to controlled inflation, recession, are we there now? Are we leaning in towards, uh, towards recession? You know, as an investor, you're, you're not necessarily in the market to make this particular investment right now. And so interest rates have gone up mm -hmm. while inflation gets under control and while things cool on the inflation front. Um, where, where the opportunity is for, for buyers um, and also sellers is appreciation isn't going anywhere. I keep, I keep talking about supply and demand we have, we have a supply issue with, with housing inventory and there is still a demand. The demand has, has decreased a little bit, um, but it's still there. And there are still people really waiting in the wings to, to find, find the perfect house and jump on the opportunity. Um, you know, the supply of housing, um, new homes, and existing, um, existing homes, it's at an all-time low, which means that appreciation is going to continue to go up. In the last couple of years, we've seen 20% year over year of appreciation gain. Are we going to continue to see that? Maybe not at that rate. Um, you know, instead of having 50 buyers offer on a property, mm -hmm. maybe it's only five or maybe it's 10. So the competition is lower, but the supply still isn't there. And so, you know, if, if we go from a 20% appreciation rate to a 10% appreciation rate, that's still a heck of an investment. Yeah. And then if we, if we go back to what I was saying before about historically, as inflation gets under control, interest rates drop. A buyer could get into an investment today with a little bit higher of an interest rate, but also reap the benefits down the road. If it's six months, if it's a year, if it's 18 months, whatever that is, eventually there would be the opportunity to refinance while you've also continued to gain appreciation. So, And Andy, just picking up on what you said about there being less competition, um, 
that's a real positive for buyers in this market because we were seeing last year 25 and 30 offers on a property and pushing properties up a couple hundred thousand dollars yeah. asking. So yes, the interest rate might be a lower, a little bit higher, but the purchase price potentially of what you would have paid if you had 25 people you were competing against might be a little lower. And so do you feel like that, that is still making it a good time for make people to make a purchase? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, the truth is, is that real estate in general is one of the safest investments somebody can make. And it's, it's an investment that you can historically make the most amount of appreciation. And we'll get into, into that. I've got some different slides um, that show housing appreciation through recession, times of recession. And um, it, it's one of the safest investments uh, and, and truly one of the largest investments that people gain long-term wealth from is mm -hmm. from real estate. And so if somebody's willing to, to sort of bite the bullet now and take the higher rate and the higher payment in the short term, the benefits long-term certainly outweigh a, a short-term and temporary higher payment. Got it. And I'm just, I'm just curious in terms of sellers, their position. I know a lot of sellers are, are you know, like, okay, well now the market is kind of, you know, cooling off some, you know, what can we, what, what do you have to say to sellers? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, well, you've got the benefit of all of this appreciation that's occurred over the past year and a half or so. So the value of your house has climbed significantly. Um, I don't know that it's dropping. The value is dropping. Things may be leveling off. That's how mm -hmm. I'm seeing it on the real estate side. What are you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I mean, are things dropping or are they really just getting back to, to true, true value? I mean, a, a year ago, we were seeing things listed like Lorna was talking about. We were seeing things listed at one price. Let's, let's call it a million dollars. And all of a sudden you see it was sold for 1.35 and you're going, mm -hmm. what? So I think, you know, certainly we're seeing some, some price drops, but is that, is that because they were overpriced to start with and were really just getting back to where they should have been all along? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, for sellers, of course, it depends on somebody's, somebody's motivation. If somebody's downsizing or moving out of state or um, maybe, maybe they want to keep their house and, and purchase something else and use the equity in their current property to purchase something else or purchase an investment property or purchase a property for their kids or whatever the story is. There's a lot of ways to tap into that, to that equity, depending on what, what somebody's motivation is and what their, their motives are. Right. And I know every case is different, Andy, um, but do you have any general sense of where we are with refi interest rates? Are they following the same kind of pattern as an, you know, first time uh, as an initial purchase or or how is that looking in comparison? Refi, refi rates in general are always a little bit higher than, mm -hmm. than purchase rates. Um, I mean, again, going back to the investor that's purchasing a $500,000 30-year note as an mm -hmm. investment, odds are that that person refinancing today will likely refinance and get out of that loan in the next 12 months. So that's driving interest rates up on, on refinances. Again, it depends on what somebody's motivation is. Refinancing and pulling cash out to consolidate credit card debt or pay off student loans or whatever the case is, um, you know, a, a five and a half percent or six percent interest rate is much cheaper than, than credit card debt. That's for sure. Um, and you also have tax benefits of, of uh, the mortgage and, and so forth. So yeah, it's refinances are down drastically, like 90% from where they were last year. Mm. Um, and that's just, again, you know, it's, it's got to make sense. The numbers need to need to pencil out from a refi perspective. Right. And as we continue this discussion, um, I just want to remind people that if they have a question to pop it into the Q&A and we'll weave it in. Okay, so I'm going to move on here. Um, the, 
the next thing to consider, and again, talking about the supply and demand factor, um, and also talking about where, where the opportunity is as well, we have an entirely, we have two new generations of buyers coming in. We have the millennials, and we also have uh, the Generation Z buyers. And if you look at these numbers, these are these are in the millions. So collectively, these two groups at the at the bottom make up more than the entire baby boomer population. And these mm. folks here at the bottom are just now entering into the housing market. So yes, we have a shortage of of supply in inventory, but there's a lot of folks in these groups here that are just waiting in the wings. Mm -hmm. Which this, you know, is also an opportunity for, for sellers, um, for those that think that the housing market is, is softening and so forth. Not necessarily true. If it's the right property, there are, there are buyers out there. Absolutely. That's a lot of Gen Zers. That is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, our little kids. <laughs> so this is this is a little um, graphic here. Uh, cost of waiting, and again, this goes back to the current opportunity and the current opportunity for buyers that are maybe sitting on the fence a little bit and waiting and teetering to see what what happens and and how things turn out um, in terms of interest rates and things like that. These, these numbers here in terms of property value and appreciation are very conservative. These are pulled from CoreLogic. CoreLogic is notorious for being incredibly conservative. They thought we were going to see an actual appreciation, well, a depreciation during 2020 and 2021. They completely undershot both years by a landslide on what their, their speculated appreciation rate was going to be. So keep that in mind when we're looking at this. This is, I did a cost of waiting analysis for a purchase of a million dollar property with 10% down. Yes, that's a thing. You don't need 20% to buy a property. You can, depending on the purchase price, credit score, all of those things, you can put as little as five or 10% down or 15% down. 20% is, is a big myth. Once you get into higher price points and so forth, you, you do generally speaking need 20%. But I did a cost of waiting on a million dollar home. Um, this is based on today, mm -hmm. general, a, a very general rough interest rate on a 30 year loan, 10% down. So $100,000 plus closing costs. You pay a million bucks, you're financing $900,000 waiting six months. Again, this is really conservative. I think the appreciation number for, was it June or July was instead of 19.8%, it was like 17.2%. Mm. So this is ultra conservative. Even if we saw a 5% a appreciation or a 10% appreciation, these numbers are a little bit off, but this is just to give you a general idea of the cost of waiting. So as as you wait out the market and wait for this mysterious housing crash that people are talking about and, and things like that, the cost of properties are going up. Appreciation continues to go up. I did, just for the sake of, of easy, easy reference, I used the same rate across the board. I don't have a crystal ball. Six months, they could drop by a full percentage point. That would obviously mean the payments drop substantially mm -hmm. as well, but just for the sake of seeing apples to apples over the course of a three-year period, this, according to this very conservative analysis over three years, <clears throat> excuse me, you would have appreciated $130,000 in equity. Mm -hmm. That doesn't take into consideration um, the amount that you would have paid off, paid down your loan over the three years. So as the property values go up, that also means that you're going to end up having to finance more. So waiting two years, if, you're, if your value goes up $78,000, all of a sudden the million dollar property you were looking at today is now almost $1.1 million. That means you're financing more and that means your payment is more. Even if we keep it at the same interest rates across the board, which we know rates fluctuate on a daily basis, just like stocks do. Their, mm. their live securities, they, they buy and sell just like stocks. So they change on a daily basis. 
the likelihood of that these rates will maintain over the next three years is, is very slim. So property values go up, which means you need to also have more money down and your monthly payments go up. Even if rates go down, your payment's going up because you're paying more for the property. All right. I have a question too. Um, are the supply issues, which we were discussing a little bit ago, at all price points in the market, or is it primarily with entry level or first time buyers price points? Oh, it's it's everywhere. It is absolutely everywhere. Um, we, you know, having trouble finding a good place for people at, well, we're in LA County, so we'll say at 800,000, we're having equally difficult finding um, uh, properties at 2 million and 3 million. It's, it's all over the place, just a very low inventory of properties kind of across the board. Yeah, and I think it's important too. The reality is, is that when most of the time, at least what, I, what I've seen, um, I've done real estate lending for 24 years. And what I've seen is 99% of folks that, that purchase their first home, either refinance it or sell it in the first five years. So <clears throat> food for thought. If you can buy a property, if you're on a five-year plan or a seven-year plan, whatever that looks like, um, over the co course of owning the home, you you would certainly gain equity and and be able to cash that out once you once you sell the property. Um, yeah. Or by the same token, once you refinance, once rates mm -hmm. lower and so forth, you could refinance and lower your monthly your monthly cost. This slide is really fantastic, Andy. I'm glad that you you popped this in for us because there's always that question about, you know, and people want to time the market. And I get it. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, you're unsure. So it's like, well, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's a bubble. It's going to pop and all these different things. But when you get down to it, you know, values continue to increase. We're not there. We're not in 2008 when the market was crashing mm -hmm. and all those liar loans were happening. And, you know, we're in a different situation now and people have tons of equity in their homes and, you know, they can sell and they don't have to worry about losing yeah. money or short sales and things like that. So this is different market now. Yeah. And that's another thing too, is there's, there's so much PTSD from 2008, 2009, so 2010, mm -hmm. everybody automatically goes to like recession, the housing market slowing. Oh my gosh, we're going back to 2008. There's going to be this flood of foreclosures and I'm going to wait for, for a really great deal on a property. And like you were just talking about Tracy, the truth is, is that the average homeowner has like 40, almost 50% in equity in their property. If, if I have that much equity and let's say I lose my job, I can't pay my mortgage payment, whatever. I am not going to let that house foreclose. I'm going to sell it. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. sell it. I'm going to cash out my equity and I'm going to yeah. move on. So we're not anywhere close to that. And um, so the thought of dozens or you know thousands of of foreclosures popping up on on the market isn't we're not there we're not anywhere near there lending has has completely transformed since 2008 2009 uh, regulations were put in place uh, loans are pretty pretty cut and dry there are of course different variations uh investor loans and things like that that are a little more risky um but in general default rates and foreclosure rates and forbearance rates, all of those things are at historically low levels. So, all right. Okay, mortgage rates and recession. I had talked about this earlier and this slide here shows all the way back to 1972. And these shaded areas here are years of recession. And you can see here back in 1982, rates went from 18% to 13%. Then we've got 1991, they dropped. 2002, they dropped. 2008, 2009, they also dropped. And in 2020, during the COVID recession, they also dropped. So here we are in 2022, and we are... According to the definition of recession, we 
somebody should be calling it quick. Um, the definition of a recession is, is two consecutive quarters of, of uh, lowered or negative GDP. We're mm-hmm. there. We just had our second, second straight quarter of, of lowered GDP reported. So according to the definition. Yeah. Uh, factors affecting mortgage rates. I don't want to sound like a broken record. Inflation. Inflation, inflation, inflation. The cost of goods is is what drives mortgage rates or inflation does. And so as the feds get more get inflation under control, mortgage rates are going to drop. Okay. Inflation, we're all feeling it. So by definition, inflation causes the US dollar to use its value relative to to a basket of global currencies. As the US dollar loses its value, the value of things denominated in US dollars falls too. This includes mortgage-backed bonds. Again, if the dollar is only worth 90 cents, let's say, and you're an investor buying a $500,000 30-year note, that $500,000 investment isn't really worth $500,000 because the dollar is only worth 90 cents. Right. Um, so as, as mortgage bond prices fall, mortgage bonds yield rise. These bond yields are, are the basis for mortgage rates. Keep your eye on the 10-year treasury. That's mm. really the, the indicator for, for mortgage rates and for, for, for 30-year, 30-year mortgage rates. Keep your eye on that and especially keep your eye on it during as we lean into Q4, keep your eye on the 10-year treasury. It's it's up on every every economic channel, you know, if it's CNBC or whatever it is, you can you can see the ticker with with the 10-year yield. We want it below 3%. As as you see it tick down, that means that mortgage rates are dropping. And it changes literally by the minute. So we could see a vast fluctuation on in a single day. As it goes up, and especially as it goes over the three percent mark, that's where mm-hmm. we were a month ago or so, when we saw interest rates around five and a half, six percent, sometimes even over six percent. So keep your eye on that. And in terms of inflation, this is really important too because inflation is measured on a month-over-month basis, but it's also compared year over year. So when when we're looking at inflation numbers. For July of 2022, we're comparing it to July of 2021. We're comparing mm-hmm. those numbers to the, the identical month from the previous calendar year. And so these numbers here are from June of 2022. We just got the inflation read for, for July of 2022. Again, we're comparing it year over year based on the specific month, but we're also comparing it month over month. So they're looking at the increase from May from May to June, June to July, but they're also comparing where the inflation rates were July to July, June to June, and so forth. The indicator for inflation getting under control, if we're comparing July, or let's say June, because these numbers are here, June of last year, the inflation rating for June of last year was 5, 5.4, I believe. I might be off by a fraction of a percent. It's like 5.4 or 5.6. June of 2022, our year over year read was 9.1. If we're looking at July's numbers for inflation, July inflation numbers were flat. There was no increase, there was no drop. That is a good thing. That means that the, that's a sign that, that inflation is getting under control. As we lean into the latter months of 2022 and we start to compare the latter months of 2021, Mm -hmm. we'll start to see these gaps lessen. We're going to see, because inflation continued to go up last year, right? Towards the end of last year is when we really started to see a, a big uptick. And then as we lean into 2022. So as we're comparing the latter months of last year with the latter months of this year, while the Fed has also increased that Fed fund rate, 
is where we're going to see the difference. And that's when we'll start to see the, the improvement with mortgage rates. All of a sudden, if we're comparing last year to this year with inflation, mm -hmm. and it's getting under control, we're going to see improvement with mortgage rates. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on that? Gas and energy is, uh, wow. It's, it's wild. Yeah, that's really wild. Lauren, are you asking your own questions? I am time? not. That is, I do not know how someone is typing my name, but thank you so much. <laughs> there is another question. <laughs> There's a question the here. It was not me. Is thinking about the idea that the value of properties increasing on the slide. Um, if property sales are slower due to less inventory, what drives the increase in the value of the properties? That's a good question. That's a really good question. It's supply and demand. It is. It is a supply and demand issue. I mean, you think about it, there's, you know, say there's three properties in your neighborhood that are on the market. But there's, you know, you've got buyers who want the want to live in that neighborhood, but there's mm -hmm. only three properties available. So you've got people going in, bidding up those properties that are on the market. And so the, so the value of them is heightened and the sale price is heightened. The equity has increased for everybody who lives in those neighborhoods. It's a straight supply and demand. I think it's also important to note too that that in terms in terms of property values and in terms of and I you guys can speak more to this than I can um, this is way more your lane than mine but in terms of property values you know you guys aren't pulling out list prices just out of out of the air it's based on past sales and you're right. looking at the most recent past sales. If the most recent past sale was a month ago um, at a specific price, obviously you're looking at square footage and upgrades and all of those things. Um, the, the appreciation is also dictated by sales comps. Yes. As it's well as the demand. Important appraisal. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the funny thing is too, now that you're mentioning it, yes. Yeah, so when we do run comps, when we do look, you know, when we are looking at what is the market value of a property, we're looking at the last three months, you know, of sales is what we try and focus on. And, you know, of course, comparing like to like in terms of the size of the property and number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and all that stuff. So we were looking at that and pricing it. But honestly, We'd look at that. We'd say, okay, based on what we're looking at, this property is worth a million dollars. You know, this was when, you know, there were 30 and 40 offers on the table at a time. This property is worth a million dollars and it get bid up to 1.3, you know, or mm -hmm. 1.4 or something. And so it, we were going outside of what we were looking at. Like we, it was difficult to try and catch up because you think you know what the value of a property is based on past sales, but things were happening so fast that, you know, and there were so few properties and so many buyers because the interest rates were so attractive that the properties were just going above and beyond what we ever even imagined. Yeah. Sometimes that was an appraisal issue, sometimes not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, a, 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 a property is, is assessed based on, on past sales, but also in terms of the, the demand factor, if somebody, if somebody really wants a house and they're willing to pay what they need to pay to get it, that's going to drive appreciation up. And it could be, it could be the, the unicorn in the neighborhood, but nevertheless, it still helps to drive appreciation up. it definitely helps to drive <laughs> appreciation up and when you have to answer the other person um the other person's question um you know when you have a situation where there's not a lot of inventory and there are a lot of buyers and a lot meaning two or more <laughs> it's really all you need you know if somebody decides they're gonna uh you know waive the appraisal and they'll they'll put in more cash to get it at this higher price 
that's also a reason why uh, home values are increased. It's very buyer driven. Very buyer driven. Definitely. Yeah. And this, I not to not to really try to drive it home. These are just some some historical numbers for inflation rates, and you can see if we got if we got an inflation rate for year over year at nine point one percent, you can see that the overall inflation rate for 2021 was 4.7. Mm -hmm. um, and that's collectively, you know, taking all the months together. Um, oops, uh, we're, we're up way up from that. So as yeah. we start to see the 9.1% come down, um, that's a great thing for housing. And again, as we see mortgage rates come down, without a doubt, all these buyers that have been sitting sort of on the sidelines and on, on the fence waiting for, for some housing crash or waiting to see what, what happens as interest rates move down, all of a sudden we've got, we've got the, the mad dash and the scramble with, with multiple buyers on the same property because rates have dropped. Yeah. So, and that means lots of buyers who can't make that purchase. Mm -hmm. Exactly. By people who all want the same property, guess what? Only one of them is going to get it. So yeah. where are the 24 going, especially when there's low inventory? Exactly. Um, so to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of talk about recession. Um, one of the one of the main signs of a recession is is unemployment rates. What's really important about this is, is that we employment unemployment rates are at an all-time low if we see a, a tiny bit of unemployment the unemployment rate rises mm -hmm. that unemployment rising is an indicator of of recession oops okay recession um recession is a, a it's a normal cycle of economics. You saw in the last, in one of the previous slides, we've had multiple recessions over the course of, of US history. It's mm -hmm. not reason to panic. Um, certainly things seem a little unsettled and what's going on and the stock market has, has tanked from where it was a year ago, certainly. Um, and again, the unemployment as we start to see a little uptick on, on unemployment rates, that's an indicator of, of recession. Um, but what, is it, what does it mean for housing? And what, what really is a, a, a recession? Um, it's a, re a recession is a period of economic decline. It, it's signaled by an increase in unemployment, a drop in the stock market, and a dip in the housing market. A dip in the housing market though, because because we have such low inventory levels, mm -hmm. we're naturally going to have a dip in the market. It doesn't mean there's not just as many buyers. It there's no houses. Right. So of course, if we're talking about numbers and we're talking about about statistics and we're talking about a dip in the housing market, mm -hmm. there just isn't enough inventory. So which I just have to say to sellers who are considering selling. I mean, there are going to be lots of people who are going to want your house. Yes. It's, you know, people who are on the fence, it's, it's surprising to me. You know, you have to know where you're going next, what you're going to do next, and what you're going to do with those proceeds and how that's going to affect your life, of course. But if there are thoughts about selling, it's, it's, it's the time. And I think even sellers are waiting around for, oh, well, we want the interest rates to go down. So yeah. more buyers pushing the price up of our property. but there's still buyers out there. And if you've got a good product in all likelihood, it's going to sell and it's going to sell at a great price. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So a recession is technically de defined as um, when the GDP or gross domestic product um, has declined for two or more quarters. I mentioned this before, we just had our, our second quarter in a row of um, decline in GDP. So are we in a recession now? We could be. I mean, the only thing that seems to not be tying in is this unemployment because we've got this historically low unemployment rate. That just seems like the weird anomaly. 
I, it's tough. It's tough because numbers are also very skewed. Um, unemployment, you have people that are just quitting their jobs. Yeah. Right. Um, and people not necessarily even going back to work. Um, and again, if, if we're at historically low levels of, of unemployment, any sort of uptick of job loss is going to move that needle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it may, it, it doesn't a recession or unemployment rates going up doesn't necessarily mean some big doomsday. Um, There's lots of reason that unemployment could go up, right? The the cost Mm. of goods is more expensive. It's more expensive to run a business Um, or getting people. I know that there's, there's shortages of, of employees and workers and manufacturing and, and all kinds of things. So it doesn't necessarily mean a, a doomsday unemployment situation. If we see mm-hmm. the needle move just a little mm-hmm. bit, it may, unemployment's gone up and that is an indicator of, of recession. Yeah. Um, high interest rates, high inflation are both. Here we are. Right. Here we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, real wages don't buy as much. This is again, inflation. The value of the dollar is not is is isn't the value of a dollar. So and the cost of, of goods is higher. Feels recessiony. Yeah, it's. I think it's just a matter. It, it's just a matter of when they're when they're going to call it. Yeah. Um. So this is um just a quick graph. The average um. These are home sales over the last, let's see, this goes back to 19, uh, before 1980. These shaded areas here are also times of recession. If we, if we really look at this and we look at the trajectory of this graph in terms of home values, other than 2008, mm-hmm. values always continue to go up during recession, with the exception of 08. Right. Mm-hmm. And if they're call and if and if and if we're officially calling this a recession, or if we want to call this a recession, we can say that values have gone up as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, again, this is this is another graph to illustrate. These are the shaded areas are recession periods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can see, with the exception of 2008. Yeah. Just head it up. So who has questions? Um, if you have any questions, you can pop them into the Q&A. We've got about nine more minutes left. Um, and so appreciative for all this information that Andy has um has given us, but we want to give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you have. And it doesn't have to be specific to recession and inflation. And it could be something like, oh, I need to sell my condo. And what do I need to worry about? Or I want to buy a piece of property. And what do I need? What documentation do I need to start gathering together, Andy? (laughs) Um, to that process it could be something along those lines as well ladies and gentlemen well let's 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 pull one um you know related to getting ready to purchase and we always tell people when you're getting ready to purchase you know that you want to get out there and purchase something how pre-approval is required and needed Mm -hmm. and maybe andy you can talk um briefly about what is the pre-approval process and what's required Sure. And, you know, I always say, regardless of whether you think that you're immediately going to be on the house hunt, or if it's three months out or six months out, whether it's a year out, if you, if you want to get a game plan together, it's a great exercise to go through. You might really and truly surprise yourself, or it's a really great opportunity to get a game plan together and, and plan out for the next six months or a year. Mm -hmm. I have lots of clients that we chat and we get things started knowing that their intention isn't to 
isn't to actually buy for, you know, six to 12 months. It's an opportunity for us to get everything plugged in. We can look at preliminary and hypothetical numbers based mm -hmm. on qualifications now. We can also plug in and look at hypotheticals for 12 months. Maybe it's, maybe it's, you need to save more money or maybe you're self-employed and your tax returns don't quite show what you need to show to get qualified. It's an opportunity to, to get a plan in place so that mm -hmm. down the road, whenever that is, that you're ready to go. So in terms of my process, it's pretty easy. Um, people fill out an online application, depending on somebody's circumstances and so forth. I always like to do an initial call, get a little bit of background, figure out what, what people's intentions are, what, what their hopes are, what their thresholds are, so forth. Um, and then at, at that point, once I get the documentation over, I get it plugged in and we start the conversation of, of possibly preliminary numbers, or we start the conversation of this is what needs to happen to get you where you want to be. Yeah. And on the seller side, that same exercise, I, I would imagine with regard to figuring out what your home dreams are and getting a game plan into place with you, Andy, if you want to refi and pull some money out and maybe buy an investment property, or if you've had the house for a long time, maybe your interest rates, your interest rate is higher than what there is currently. So something to think about. There's also, there's also other loan options too, for sellers that, that want to leverage their current property to purchase another property before they've actually sold the departing residence. There's, there's a lot of tools. You never, you never know until you have the conversation. Um, and of course, everybody's circumstances are different and everybody mm -hmm. qualifies for something different, but you, you don't know until you have the conversation. There's, yeah. there's a lot of different ways to, to Make maneuver, maneuver, departing one residence and, and purchasing another. Um, and I think even um, in terms of someone using their equity, I know a lot of folks, you know, when you talk about specifically in Los Angeles and California, um, you know, what is the median price of a home is, you know, 700 and something thousand dollars. Anyway, it's kind of tough for these younger people, the millennials, the Gen Zs maybe to get into a home. And so some parents are thinking about, you know, using the equity that they've gained so much of over the past mm -hmm. couple of years to pull that out to help their kids or loved ones, you know, buy something. So that's also mm -hmm. an option too. Lots of options. Yeah, lots of options. We have one other question. What if you have no idea what neighborhood you might want to move to? How do you get started? You know how you get started. You call us. <laughs> you figure that out. Yeah, and <laughs> see yeah, what your I needs say, are and your desires. Yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say. You know, we've got to. You need to assess what your goals are, where you want to be, what's the proximity to work, or if you're working from home, what kind of neighborhood you want to be in. You know, we really need to go through that exercise. You need to go through that exercise. Yeah. Well, and, but, and budget, budget is also going to dictate that the exercise of getting, of getting pre-approved call Tracy and Lorna initially. And, and then we can talk through what your goals, what your, your monthly budget th thresholds look like and um, figure out what, what area you can afford. Yeah. 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 All right. And as we get ready to wrap it up, you know, we just want to thank you again, Andy, for taking the yeah. time out to go through this with us. You know, there's so much, as Lorna had said before, all the hype, you know, in the media and you had talked about it too. And so it's nice to hear, you know, the straightforward, real deal about what's happening with the housing market and interest rates and the recession and all that. So we really do appreciate it. And we really appreciate all of you guys who participated this evening. We know your time is valuable. We don't like to waste your time, but really try to provide information that you can use um, and discuss with your loved ones to figure out the next best steps for you guys and whatever your journey is um, with regard to real estate. Thank you so much for having me. And as always, I'm happy to be a resource and answer questions and I'm here. Yeah, you are. And you're a yeah. great resource. All day. 
every yep. day. We love working with <laughs> you and love to send our clients to you. And there she is. Every <laughs> so before before we, <laughs> I didn't realize it, it was that big. I, I love it's it. Fabulous. It's fabulous. <laughs> um, you know, take her information. Give Andy a call. She can run some scenarios for you. They can be scenarios that don't affect your credit, but just a conversation to kind of help you figure out where, what direction you want to go in. Exactly. Yeah. My daughter will be calling you soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys, thanks so much for attending tonight and That's reach out to us. If you fun. have any questions that didn't get answered here or if something pops into your head and please feel free to call Andy as well. We appreciate you all joining us. Any parting words, Lorna, Andy? Have a great evening, everybody. Make something healthy and wonderful for dinner. And <laughs> uh, enjoy your time with your loved ones. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.